This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 75 is the editor of Jung's Black Books, Professor Sonu Shamdasani in London, England. He is professor in Jung history in the School of European Languages, Culture, and Society, Vice Dean International of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, and co-director of the Health Humanities Center at University College London. After receiving his undergraduate degree from the University of Bristol, he earned a master's degree in the history of science and medicine from Imperial College and a doctorate in the history of medicine from the Wellcome Institute for the History of Medicine at UCL. He is an historian of psychology and psychiatry, specializing in the work of C.G. Jung. In 2003, he founded, along with Stephen Martin, the Philemon Foundation, the successor to the Bollingen Foundation, which originally made possible the publication of Jung's collected works. With the support and contractual collaboration of the Foundation of the Works of C.G. Jung, the charitable successor to the Association of the Heirs of C.G. Jung, The Philemon Foundation is authorized to raise funds to edit and prepare for publication Jung's unpublished manuscripts, seminars, and correspondences, numbering in the tens of thousands of pages. Professor Shamdasani currently serves as their general editor and as chief editor of the Philemon series, overseeing the publication of the unpublished works of C.G. Jung. He is the author of Cult Fictions, C.G. Jung and the Founding of Analytical Psychology, winner of the 1999 Gradiva Prize for the Best Historical and Biographical Work from the World Association for the Advancement of Psychoanalysis, Jung and the Making of Modern Psychology, The Dream of a Science, Jung Stripped Bare by His Biographers Even, and C.G. Jung, A Biography in Books, He is co-author of The Freud Files, An Inquiry into the History of Psychoanalysis, and Lament of the Dead, Psychology After Jung's Red Book. He is also the editor of C.G. Jung's The Psychology of Kundalini Yoga, Notes of the Seminar, given in 1932, Michael Fordham's Analyst-Patient Interaction, Collected Papers on Technique, Theodore Flournoy's From India to the Planet Mars, A Case of Multiple Personality with Imaginary Languages, and, with Michael Munchau, Speculations After Freud, Philosophy, Psychoanalysis, and Culture. Professor Shamdasani is best known as editor and co-translator of C.G. Jung, The Red Book, Liber Novus, and the newly released seven-volume set, C.G. Jung, The Black Books, 1913 to 1932, Notebooks of Transformation, which is the subject of our talk today. Please visit the website Speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G, dot com, where you'll find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This interview is being recorded on Tuesday, October 27th, 2020, through the magic of Zoom. Professor Shamdasani, I want to thank you, your co-translators, Martin Liebscher and John Peck, the Foundation of the Works of C.G. Jung, the Flamen Foundation, and W.W. Norton, for bringing these books to life. Not only the newly released Black Books, but the Red Book and the Flamen series as well, because this isn't interpretation or discussion or debate about Jung's work. This is Jung's work, and you've made it available to all of us. Thank you for being here today. Thanks, you're welcome. So you are an historian, and in your work, you look at how psychologies are formed. Is that right? That's right. And would you tell us how the Red Book and the Black Books figure into us discovering how Jung formed his analytical psychology? Simply put, uh, these uh, works are at the center of 
the formation of Jung's oeuvre. It's precisely in these that Jung becomes the figure that is recognizable to us today and takes up his position in Western intellectual history, uh, as well as uh, leading to the instigation of analytical psychology as uh, it would be interdisciplinary science of psychology and as a school orientation of, of psychotherapy. And he himself says that his whole life in the main from that point onwards uh, consisted in attempting to uh, comprehend, to elaborate, to frame, to contextualize uh, what he first uh, come to light during that period, first documented in the Black Books from 1913 onwards, then elaborated from that in the text of the, the Red Book, Nibinovus, which presents the key episodes from 1913 to 1916, together with Jung's understanding of their significance up to that point. In an interview that you did in 2009 with the Times of India, you said that you thought contemporary psychology and psychotherapy was sort of in a mess, and you wanted to figure out how it had gotten into that state, which led you to studying the history of psychology. So you had done work prior to the work you did on Libra Novus and the Black Books. And so I'd like to start there because I want to know how you got here to where we are today. Um, I'd be interested in knowing that myself. So, <laughs> um, to take your first point, um, in 1894, William James argued that well, regarding the state of psychology as a would-be science is that you know, there wasn't even one law that all psychologists could agree upon, let alone the terms in which such formulation would take place. And you find that uh, what psychologists at that time called like a Tower of Babel um, just continuing in terms of there is a continued insistence on the use of the word psychology and that psychology is a science of some shape, but little consensus beyond that. Now, that's not to say that valuable and interesting enterprises, theories and conceptions haven't developed in the 20th century bearing the name psychology. But the question is, what is this? If this is a science, it doesn't resemble uh, what these psychologists initially imagined that they were uh, emulating or simulating I, uh, the natural sciences. So my interest in them is, is looking at like, okay, how did these enterprises uh, come about and what, what did they actually do? And I think it helps them to understand them, to look at their social historical contexts. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Jung, um, I had a long-standing interest in Jung and when I started my historical researches, it was quite clear that quite literally the largest share of Jung's works were, were still unpublished. And there was a whole host of both public and private archives that uh, had barely been um, tapped. And so the task became one of like reconstructing the formation of analytical psychology and of Jung's work. His, the intellectual formation, my, my interest is not in Jung's biography, but his, his ideas, uh, which was also Jung's own interest. He was more interested in, in, in his ideas than in, in, in the details of his own biography. And to reconstruct that from the ground up, which it required a certain way, you know, clearing the ground of myths and misconceptions and starting on, on, on documentary evidence. So, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Red Book, um, I had been um, pointed to edit Jung's seminar on Kundalini Yoga. And at that stage, I came into contact with the Society of Heirs of, of C.G. Jung. And at that time, it was a fortuitous moment because they had just uh, 
coming to a close was they had uh, financially supported the publication of Jung's works in German, and we're just beginning to look at uh, the vast hoard of material, and it's starting to um, realize that a full catalogue of Jung's manuscripts, and even that was not fully complete, was only done in 19, at the end of 1993. So when I started doing, you could say that the Swiss part of my research is after my first uh, European and American based archival researchers, there was all those the material that no one had even looked at. Mm-hmm. And it was in the course of those researches that I came across um, transcriptions that Jung had, had had made of Lieber Novus, the Red Book, and that entered into a conversation in that course of to collaboration with the Society of C.G. Jung as to what to do with these materials. Um, and on the basis of proposals that I made as to how it could be published and understood, they agreed to release it for publication. The Black Books came about later, that was taken up, um, although they featured in, in terms of the apparatus of the Red Book, it was central to establishing a chronology and understanding how these works were put together. Uh, that project started in, in 2009 through a conversation I had with my then uh, editor, W.W. Uh, w. Norton, uh, Jim Mars, who's now deceased in terms of quite such, he's like, well, what do we need to do now? I said, well, how about the black books? And uh, we took it from there. So both works are, you could say, interlinked aspects of an unpublished manuscript corpus. About um, 50% of the text of the red book comes from the black books. And uh, the subsequent paintings in the calligraphic volume of the red book actually don't refer any to the text which they're placed next to, but rather to the later fantasies in, in the black books. So in a way, you, you, you need to read them side by side. Was it always the intention, your intention, the intention to publish the black books after the red book? Initially, there wasn't a, a clear intention. It seemed to me uh, when I was engaged in editing the Red Book, I thought, okay, one day I'd love to have a conversation about what happens next, i.e. the fantasies after the end of the text of the Red Book right, from 1916 onwards. But that seemed uh, a way off at that time. I think actually it makes inherent sense to have them in that order and to have had a good decade uh, for people to read, immerse themselves, study, um, and get to grips with um, the Red Book because it presents material that had already been worked on by Jung, already framed, and you have the benefit of how he'd come to understand that material. Whereas the black books are unfiltered, they're raw. So in a way, Jung's understanding that he presents in the red book is helpful to understand the black books. And the same is true vice versa. To read the black books helps you understand the genesis of the red book. That's why I'm saying these, these two works are interlinked. Yes. And before we get into what is contained in the black books, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Philemon series Liber Novus and the Black Books are part of this series. And I found something interesting on their website that most of us who read Jung are familiar with Jung's collected works. And in the beginning, I kind of thought that was everything. It was all in there, 20 volumes. But on the Philemon Foundation website, they call Jung one of the most significant well-known and controversial figures in the history of psychology and modern culture, yet the understanding of his thought rests on a textual corpus that at present is incomplete and also flawed. 
And so the Philemon series now makes available to scholars, clinicians, and the general reading public the fuller body of Jung's work. And I was wondering why they referred to his body, his present body of work as, yes, incomplete, but why flawed? Um, it's an interesting question. First, one needs to understand the type of edition that Jung's uh, collected works is, although at the beginning of volume one in the preface to the, the collected works, they announced the first collected complete edition of Jung's writings. It it was not complete. It's the type of edition that it was was not a scholarly edition. It was a a, a collection. It is a, a collection of Jung's. Uh, published works, uh, which are presented in a thematic manner. They're not presented chronologically. Um, strikingly, Jung's own recommendation when they asked him how to present these works was they should be presented in a chronological sequence, which they ignored. Mm. And if you take Jung's works, often he would write something and go through several different editions. In the collected works, they largely tended just to pick the last edition and ignore the various changes uh, that had gone on sometimes over several decades. So in that sense, it doesn't even assemble everything that Jung published in his own lifetime. And because it's not chronological and because of Jung's mode of revision, you can't tell uh, when Jung said something. And it sort of like, you could say, it didn't it fostered a kind of a non-vintage reading of Jung. Jung's elaborating work over half a century and it's absolutely critical to know what he said when and when he changed and elaborated his views it's very hard to do that with this this sort of edition uh it was not presented with with much in the way of additional editorial apparatus in terms of footnotes cross-references or contextual introductions so in that sense it's not a scholarly historical edition so he clearly did a, a, a critical work in making Jung's work available. Uh, and then the other issue is the translations uh, are deeply flawed. Um, Richard Hull, was, was the translator, was a poet, rationalist, and atheist, not terms one associates um, with Jung, and was largely unsupervised. Uh, it's the places where if he doesn't like a sentence, he he leaves it out oh my. or adds a, a modifying clause. So he saw his task in his own view as actually kind of improving on Jung. Oh. It's a literary translation. It uh, is very fluent. At times when you read a sentence, say, well, that's that sounds a great sentence, and immediately an alarm bell goes on. I try to retranslate it back. What would that be in German? And you go and check, well, it, it's actually really something quite different. But those are some of the issues with the collected works. So it was only on Jung's death that uh, they started looking at what he had in his manuscript cupboard. And a lot of manuscripts uh, came to light, unpublished manuscripts. The editors at that time, um, Michael Fordham and Gerhard Adler, wanted these to be published, but they were at that point overruled, uh, despite their protestations. And the works were uh, more or less closed. So you had this material that only really started to come to light after Jung's death, and then was only catalogued in at the end of 1993 that had just been sitting there in the archive um and on top of that you've got jung's correspondences um gerhard adler with the collaboration of annie liaffe published a, a two-volume edition of jung letters and i think they're about if I recall correctly about 1500 or so letters in that and it's one way, it's just Jung's letters. Um, at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, there, in terms of two-way correspondence, I think there were over 
35,000 correspondences alone. And that's not including um, all the correspondences in, in other archives and collections and in private archives. So uh, if you take, if you just do a rough numerical check, something like 40,000 letters, if you publish them in a two way uh, edition, like both sides of the correspondences, that would be 80 volumes straight off. Wow. And uh, with the with the, the manuscripts, uh, our, our plan with the Philemon Foundation was simply to start editing them for publication in editions that corresponded to the highest contemporary standards of, of scholarship, i.e. so to have full contextual notes and contextual introductions. And uh, there are also, in addition to manuscripts, uh, there were quite a number of seminars that had uh, yet to be published and still remains uh, many to this day. And what is the significance of that? The significance of that is when you start to look at how a canon was formed, how Jung's collected works was formed, you could say, okay, well, it's contingent. That was what was possible. That was what was done in, at that time. They, they were the first prospectus of that um, in the late in the late 1940s, and you say, well, okay, more than half a century later, scholarship advances, and you look at this and say, well, there's no reason to be uh, chained to how works were understood at that time, and you can revisit that. And it's critical then to study Jung's work in the round, and not based on, you could say, arbitrary and sometimes questionable decisions taken by people that weren't professional scholars. Mm. And so the Philemon series is currently at eight volumes. They've not all been published yet. Is that correct? I, I actually don't recall how many volumes have, have come out so far, but I think that by the time we get through the next sort of next couple of years, I think it'll come up to about 20 volumes. And there's a lot more to do if we manage to raise the funds uh, to do so. Mm -hmm. That's another thing I wanted to mention is that the Philemon Foundation is a nonprofit organization and they depend on donors. And so I will provide links to everything in the show notes for this episode at speakingofyoung.com. Thanks, that's appreciated. It doesn't earn any royalties from these works. So the Black Books are a seven volume slipcase set. The first volume is an introduction written by you. Uh, there's also your co-translators. Uh, there's a section on the runes by them, which hopefully we'll get into a little later. And it is it's actually my favorite volume because it is so comprehensive. It doesn't just cover, you don't just cover the black books in volume one. You also cover other things about Jung's life. Uh, you mention the original protocols for memories, dreams, reflections quite a bit, which you are currently editing. That too is part of the flame on series. And when do you expect that to be complete? Um, I should finish up um, by about the end of the year, and then um, it'll take a while to go through the publication process with uh, Princeton University Press. And you mention uh, the protocols quite a bit, as I said, in volume one. Also, there's some quotes from unpublished correspondence of Jung, and uh, there are some of the paintings that are contained in Liber Novus are in the appendix to that volume. So would you tell us a little bit about uh, your work on that volume uh, as an introduction to the six books, the six black books? Uh, yes, it was 
what I tried to do in the introduction was to give a general context, an overall uh, arc of what takes you to that point where he engages in this process of self uh, experimentation, what unfolds and where he goes with it, i.e. how he then tried to mine that material to develop the discipline of analytical psychology and how it also then transformed his psychotherapeutic practice and how he attempted to develop from that a replicable form of psychotherapy orientated towards the fostering of the individuation process. So it's both uh, trying to sort of introduce the black books, but also situate them in context mm -hmm. in a way to present what is new, but also bring it into relation to what is existent and to show how it links up and sheds a new light on the formation of Jung's works. Jung's black books are actually six books, six leather bound books, the first of which is brown. And I love how you say that there's always an exception to the rule somewhere. Um, but they begin with Jung's adolescent diary, which is not included. So we actually begin with book two. So there are seven volumes in the slipcase set. The seven volumes consists of the first volume is your introduction and then books two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. When we saw photos of the set before it was uh, released on October 13th of this year, 2020, we noticed that volume seven was taller than the first six. And that is because these are one-to-one -one facsimile copies of the of Jung's original black books. And someone had asked me, would you ask Professor Shamdasani when they'll be translated into German? And I said, well, no, they were translated into English. They The originals are in German. So it's the case then that Jung wrote in the last book that it's larger than the others, right? That's right. And each volume contains a full facsimile uh, of the original German handwriting. And it's gorgeous. It, these books are absolutely stunning. And they are, uh, they're hardcover. This has really made me realize how much I love and miss hardcover books because uh, we're all so used to paperback books. These are whoever designed these, I commend you because you can lay them on the table, they stay open, they are some sort of material uh, uh, cover and back cover, and they stay open and they're the paper is thick, glossy, uh, the font is beautiful, they are exquisite. So I also want to thank you for including the footnotes on the page and not in the back of the book or at the back of the chapter it makes it so much easier. And the notes are extraordinary. So this set is the entirety of Jung's entries from 1913 to 1932. And they, as you said, uh, his originals are included. And then in the translation, which you and your two colleagues did, you also uh, translated his, when he underlined a word, it's underlined in the translation. If there is in uh, a word that is kind of scribble, you, you uh, put those as X's. So it is very, the, the translation is, is almost exact. Well, we tried to get the transcription first as close as possible. And in, in terms of the, the, the translation, we did uh, what we could to try to create a close equivalent in, in English today. And in terms of the, the work itself, the vision for in fact, in the edition was uh, my late editor at Norton, uh, Jim Mars. And it was thanks to 
uh, the designer Laura Lingrid for putting this all together. Well, they're beautiful and they are um, quite different from the Red Book, which is this enormous volume that is kind of, you need a table for the Red Book and the Black Books stand up and they're quite striking. So let's begin by talking about what they contain. And you say that they're not personal diaries. Because at first, you know, I had heard about the Black Books. I had mentioned this to you. There's a photo, I think it's your photo, of the original Black Books sitting on a table. And there's one shot of them uh, kind of head on on their side. And that is on the Philemon Foundation website. And I always thought, okay, those were Jung's personal diaries. And, and it turns out that they're not. They're, they are records of his own unique self-experimentation where he recorded his active imaginations and his his mental states and his reflections on them. That's right. He, he doesn't write what's happening in the day or, or whether he's kind of going out to walk the dog or uh, things like that. He had a separate um, agenda in terms of noting uh, appointments and, and meetings. So it's not a daily jotter in any sense of the word, but you could say the unique record of a process of self-investigation, self-inquiry, self-scrutiny, in which he is uh, attempting to explore um, his, his fantasies through the visionary method of active imagination and inducing visual images in a waking state and, and, and noting them down. Jung determined that these fantasies he was having came from the mythopoetic layer of the psyche, which he then came to name the collective unconscious. And you, you point out that the term unconscious only appears once throughout the Black Books. That's right. This is that it belongs to, to my mind in Jung's what I call Jung's exoteric language, a terminology that Jung would use when addressing a medico scientific audience to try to legitimate his insights, legitimate his conceptions. The term that he does use in these notebooks is fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't use psychological terminology is left all that to one side. So it, it is something just to provide a record of his active imaginations and, and places his reflections on these in um, direct first person notation without any attempt to frame them in uh, a theoretical system. That means not even his own evolving theoretical system. He's left that to one side. And that is, in a certain sense, makes them, in a certain sense, more accessible. Because this is a record of the evolution of his own self-understanding, his exploration of his fantasies. Mm -hmm. And you say that they were written for his own reference, whereas the Red Book was directed toward toward an imagined reader. And I That's remember, right. yeah, when, when the Red Book first came out in the uh, fall of 2009, afterward, there was a seminar at the Jung Center in Chicago that I attended given by the Lavins. And they had just returned from the exhibition at the Rubin Museum. And they were so excited. And there was a huge crowd at the Jung Center. And they told us all about it. And there was talk, I remember at the time, as to whether or not Jung intended to have the Red Book published. And there were some people that in the crowd there that were quite upset saying, you know, Jung never, never wanted this published. And that's why the family you know, resisted having it published and why it took so long. And this isn't right. And Dr. Lavin said, well, 
Professor Shandasani, in the introduction, he does say that, yes, this was intended for publication. Uh, yes, it's a work that was written for publication, though never published. Jung spent a lot of time deliberating what to do about it. Um, so if you take the sequence, he's writes a thousand page handwritten manuscript of the text of, of the Red Book. He has this transcribed. He then retranscribes it into the calligraphic volume. I hate to back into um, script. He then has this retyped out, retranscribed because he's changed the text. And there's also another partial transcription that I've seen. You don't sp send people to laboriously retype out multiple times a manuscript um, if it's just there for your own purposes. Mm -hmm. And if you read the whole text, it is, a, it is an address to a reader. Um, and you don't engage in quite lengthy, close textual copy editing of a work that is simply there for your own purposes. So as I said, it was intended for publication and then left to one side and towards Jung's, uh, towards the end of his life, he left various stipulations which are pretty much the same as what he was saying at that time when people approaching him regarding the publication of the, the four Jung letters, was that it should be maybe put in an archive and uh, put under restriction for like, you know, 20, 30 or so years. And it should be studied in the context of the evolution of his work. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely how I intended to present it, that if he was in ambivalent about his publication, he should at least not be ambivalent about the form in which it's it's published. And it then also forms the basis for Jung's collected works. And I have a sense that as a writer, Jung, if he didn't want something to see the light of day, he would, um, he would um, light a pipe with it or, or put it in the stove. So he he knows he's a historical figure. Um, he knows about historical editions. Mm -hmm. You get that sense also with his uh, late correspondences. He's writing answers that clearly are not just written to the recipient. Mm -hmm. He has in, he knows that copies are being made and that there's um, a good chance that a number of these letters will be published. So in that sense, yes, they're private letters written to some someone particular, but he also knows posterity in that case is, is looking over his shoulder. These are the black books. They were not written for publication in contrast to the red book. Mm -hmm. uh, there, it is a personal record, but the whole significance of them as Jung himself understood them was that what was taking place in them did not just concern himself. So you could say the main thesis of, of Jung at this stage is the deeper you go into your own subjectivity, the more, the less personal it becomes. I, in his view, he was mining not just his own subjective states, as in a purely personal or purely pertaining to him, but the mythic layers of the human mind. And which in his you could say, published scholarly work, he termed the collective unconscious. So in his view, if there's anything valid in, in that hypothesis, which is a uh, fairly central hypothesis of his work, what is taking place in there is not just merely relevant to himself. 
And in that sense, they also form, you could say, the basis of his um, work. And I think that that, as he says to his um, friend and student, Kerry Baines, when he asked her to transcribe uh, the text of, of the Red Book from the calligraphic volume, he says, well, by doing that, you'll also understand my my ideas from the ground up, and many questions will come up which didn't come up in our uh, in our analysis. So that's as he understood these as as foundational for his works, and also it's also worth noting that when it came to the preparation of publication of Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which were put together by uh, Agnelli Yaffe and the legendary editor of Pantheon Books, Kurt Wolf, he made these works available. Um, he gave her permission to use, as she saw fit, materials from the Red and the Black books. So had she made different editorial decisions or with those involved in the project made different editorial decisions, a lot more of this material could have been, could have surfaced at that time. I remember when uh, the Red Book came out and some people were stunned by some of the paintings in there. I remember thinking, well, wait a minute. I saw some of these in Yafe's book, C.G. Jung, Word and Image. And so I, I wasn't as stunned because th there they were. And there's even a photograph of Jung's Red Book in Word and Image. That's right. So yes, a number of these, um, a few of the pages had been produced in Word and Image, but not on a one-to-one -one scale. And right. it's a very valuable volume which has got great, great stuff in it, but the color reproduction was not mm -hmm. accurate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a way it was not, it was somewhat unfortunate that for me, that works of, the, of that significance came out on a truncated scale mm -hmm. uh, without accurate color, color rendition, which is why um, it was in my view so valuable that the Red Book came out in a full facsimile edition. Yes. And that's why it's so large. Yeah. Right. And you also mentioned that Jung sort of depersonalized what he included in the Red Book. So he would edit out his own things that pertain just to him so that the Red Book could be more objective. That's right. He's he's composing what I call a work of psychology, but in a literary form, mm -hmm. and attempting to make the material easier to follow and more comprehensible for a reader. And you say that both works illumine one another. The Red Book explains passages of the Black Books, and the Black Book enable one to understand the genesis of the Red Book and Jung's self-experimentation. So let's talk a little bit about his fantasies and what they were. Jung was questioning his soul. He was seeking knowledge and understanding from his soul. And you you mentioned he was doing this in the evenings and he was working during the day. And in the footnotes, it includes, well, Jung saw five patients this day or Jung saw seven patients this day. And there was really no indication in his daily waking, his working life that he was undergoing these intense dialogues in the evenings. Yeah, I tried to sort of give a sense of his, of the materiality of his practice. I, what is the context of this? Uh, what is he doing each day? And as much as I could sort of gather information uh, about that. And I also 
whilst working on both the Red Book and the Black Book, I studied Jung's extant correspondences, or uh, well, the bulk of them at the in the Jung archives at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, and also substantial uh, correspondences held elsewhere. And you don't get a hint of what Jung is engaged with at this time, except for when with one or two intimates he's discussing his experience. That's, they're very few. Mm -hmm. And you get a sense that it's all really quite strictly compartmentalized. Um, he's, he's doing his regular stints uh, of military service each year. He's, um, for the bulk of this period, he's having fortnightly lectures of the Association of Analytical Psychology. You go through all the minutes, there's absolutely no reference to this material. There are ideas that you begin to see, oh, okay, I can see where that idea is coming from. Mm -hmm. That's presented in conceptual psychological um, language. So he's he's keeping these uh, streams separated. In fact, there's a phrase he uses in some of his latest seminars, he talks about compartment psychology. It's a way of like this issue of keeping all of these things separate. And I think it was something that he was um, well aware of it, with himself at this time. So these fantasies that he was having were with his inner figures. And there are some figures that um, that that returned that were in the Red Book, and then there are some additional figures. And then something else that I found really interesting is that these figures had shadows, and it wasn't just the the eye that had the shadow, but Philemon had a shadow, and Ka was kind of featured prominently. Would you tell us about Ka? Uh, yes, to, to, to the first question, um, what you find taking place is a transformation of the characters in terms of Jung's eye evolves in concert with the evolution of the characters themselves. In, in a real sense, the the plot thickens, mm -hmm. and you get new characters uh, emerging that then introduce themselves and say where they stand in relation to uh, characters that Jung's eye is is already familiar with. Um, so the figure of Ka emerges um, in the autumn of 1917, and Jung makes a very striking uh, sculpture of him, which is uh, present in the work, the art of C.G. Jung, uh, uh, published last year by the Foundation of the Works of C.G. Jung, which is also it's an essential um, reading um, a, that accompanies uh, this text. And uh, Philemon informs them that Ka is his shadow, and that uh, soul informs the eye that Ka is also the brother of, of the Buddha, which I think will become his news to, um, to the Buddhists. And for Jung, he saw this figure of Ka as counterbalancing the figure of Philemon that had appeared um, earlier. And I'll just read a passage from um, Jung's later uh, recollection. So, in the protocols for memories, dreams, reflections, from currently editing, um, what Jung stated was that Ka balances Philemon because he has a lame foot, i.e., that is Philemon, and cannot walk on the earth. Philemon is the spiritual aspect, he is meaning. The lower one, 
I think that is Ka, is the force of nature. It's he who really does everything and who robs it of meaning. He who replaces meaning with beauty, with the eternal reflection. So he then begins to see this balancing of Philemon with Ka, the spiritual purpose, the meaning, but a meaning that lacks force, that is in a way not grounded on the earth. Ka is nature, he is energy, he is what makes things happen, but is devoid of meaning. So for Jung, the issue then that he realizes is understanding these figures as principles, as powers of the depths, as animating powers, is that one needs a balance between these two things. Mm -hmm. You can't stick with one. If you stick with one, you go with meaning, but you, you, you go into a meaning that becomes spiritualized and devoid of the earth. Or if you go with the other, there's a complete loss of meaning, a loss into aesthetic reflection or contemplation or just imminence, existence, without any sense. So the question is how to combine both of these aspects. So when you look at the type of reflection that is going on uh, with these figures, but also to go back to what we were saying earlier, Jung is not in a way just thinking about how to sort himself out, but is reflecting on the powers of man, mm -hmm. what, what moves one, how, how should one live, um, and how should one balance um, these, these figures, these diamonds. And he then later framed that in, say, in conceptual terms in his collect, collected works. So a lot of the Black Books presents in a figural form issues that are present in Jung's later collected works. So if you say you shouldn't read this, well, then same token, you shouldn't read the collected works either. Mm -hmm. But like any writer, Jung sees his task as as manifestation, as, as, as making uh, available. He's a, he's a pedagogue, he's an educator, he's a therapist. So his task is not just orientated towards um, his own development, so clearly part of it is, but you know, what can he do to help others? Publication is, is then for him an essential part of that. He's a writer. And uh, although writers often keep books sometimes in a drawer, uh, anyone that writes knows, okay, it's in a drawer. <laughs> Sometimes someone may well pick it up and publish it, and that's no bad thing, necessarily. What I've heard you say, and what I take from this as well, that Jung was saying in all of this is to respect one's own inner images, not to dismiss them, no matter how crazy they are, and you know to value them and to follow them. And that is something that I did in my analysis and before I entered into Jungian analysis, I, I was, I've always been interested in psychology. And so I was, I worked with different psychologists on myself. And it wasn't until I found my analyst where I felt comfortable talking about some of my visions and my inner figures and, and the images that I had that never felt comfortable talking about because they were so bizarre and strange and scary and frightening. And my analyst didn't say, oh, you know, Laura, we, we need to, you need to be committed uh, or you need to be medicated. Uh, you're going insane. Uh, you know, you're schizophrenic. No, she accepted it and we looked at it and we work with them. So, I would like people to hear that and know that and and to pay attention to that. And that is very important here to respect one's own inner images. 
Well, in that sense, when you engage us on this enterprise, when he starts, he, in, in a way, is quite openly stating, as he later recounted in his 1925 seminar, which edited a re-edition of in the Philemon series, he states, as a rationalist, he devalued fantasy. Mm-hmm. And it was not easy for him to to acknowledge it, to look yeah. into it. Mm-hmm. So the force of the work, it precisely, is Jung's coming to terms with his own fantasy and its significance. And um, when the, the Red Book came out, I had a, a number of letters from people I didn't know um, saying, look, I thought... I thought I was crazy before I read this. Mm-hmm. Because there was someone else out there um, that's got similar types of images. I, it's not what I'm experiencing is not outside the human. Right. It is comprehensible, and also to say, okay, well, if that's what it took Jung, um, it was obviously one of the most sophisticated figures in in the new psychology at that stage. Um, someone that was really learned, uh, studied. He's a psychiatrist. He's worked 10 years in psychiatric hospital uh, or thereabouts. And that's what it took him to figure himself out. That's the effort Mm -hmm. to refine meaning in his work. It's something that gave many people courage, so okay, to take themselves seriously and and not dismiss their own um, inner experience. So in, in that sense, that kind of, that reading, that understanding, that uh, message that people took from the Red Book is amplified, is in a sense even stronger um, with the Black Books. Yes. For those that are kind of interested in that. I'd like to turn now to the women, Emma Jung, Jung's wife, Maria Moltzer, and Tony Wolf, and how they show up in the Black Books. Uh, There's been a lot written about Jung's personal relationships. A lot of people, for whatever reason, take offense to them. I've received many emails after I did an episode about it. These are his personal relationships, and the Black Books give some insights into how Jung navigates this in his own words, uh, in his own language. It's not gossip or rumors. Uh, Yes, in a sense, uh, this is a subject that has been um, subject of much rumor, gossip, fantasy, and biographies that themselves leave a lot to be desired, precisely because they've been insufficiently based on the actual historical record. And um, the Black Books and further materials I sort of cite in it give further information that, as you say, this is direct testimony um, from Jung and, and the some of the other protagonists, such as Maria Maltzer and Tony Wolf, of what they were experiencing. In terms of, uh, to contextualize this, you already find in Jung's correspondence with Freud, there's a kind of a general agreement, I think there's one letter where Jung says to Jung, you know, we never make it as moralists. So he does not see himself as a moralist. He doesn't see himself as writing an ethical code. The task of psychology was not then about becoming a better person in terms of more virtuous. Mm -hmm. Not that he's got anything against that, but the question is stating, can you just live more honestly? Mm -hmm. Can you live in a more, a less hypocritical way? Can you become more honest and more accepting of how you are living. So that to me is the step. It's about, is is that 
the question is, can you live with more honesty and understanding and less hypocrisy? So Jung and to that extent Freud too, we're not saying we are better than anyone else or we're making better people, but we're trying to actually live or present a view that is more understanding of how the human being is made up and has always been. So in that sense, so in terms of Jung's conduct, um, that to me is not is not an issue. He himself is never proclaiming himself as as a moral exemplar, but as someone that is actually comfortable in his own skin in terms of accepting his own nature and and living his life with the intended struggles. And always he necessarily, you could say, advocating that um, to others. So, yes, the context of Jung's relations with um, Maria Maltz, uh, Tony Wolf, and uh, Emma Jung were not easy, uh, uh, did cause um, suffering to all the protagonists. But you have here Jung's account of aspects of that and how that critically is a part of his endeavor in terms of what they saw is this attempt to develop more honest individual relationships as you could say the remaking of the social bond and that was a critical aspect of what the task or the role that Jung, the societal role that Jung saw for psychology. So in this, you see how some of how that played out in, in Jung's own life. Mm -hmm. In volume seven, the runes appear. They appear to Jung in 1917 from the character Ha, which we haven't talked about. And I was delighted to see them. And there's a whole section in volume one written by uh, the tr three translators about the difficulties and the challenges of translating these runes. Would you tell us about the runes? Yes. Um, these emerge in um, the late summer and autumn of, of 1917. Uh, Jung subsequently narrated to Anya Liafe in the protocols for his Jim's reflections that on one occasion, the vision of a clay tablet um, on which there were strange hieroglyphs which he couldn't uh, read or understand. And in the autumn of, of 1917, he encounters this new figure, a black magician called Ha. And um, he asks Ha, to explain these runes that he'd, um, you could say, noted earlier. And Ha reluctantly does so. He, he describes them as his science. So it's a, a runic science or uh, a science of runes. And what is striking is he literally spells them out, tracing the sequences and shapes into a narrative. And some of the figures and images, you would incorporate some of these runes within his mandala paintings that he was doing at this time. Some of the motifs of them, such as of the cones, this generative cosmological cones, also mm -hmm. reappear in his paintings in terms of a, of a complex interplay or of the above and the below. So it's a really striking sequence where you see certain images and asks this figure Ha to explain them, to interpret them. But Ha's interpretation, his explanation, is not exactly what we would call an interpretation. But is in a certain sense, it, it, it's it's quite you can you can follow it. It is like a syntactical um, 
articulation um, of these signs, you know, where you can't separate the, the semantics from from the syntax, and um, what. So what you have there is both the elaboration of here a pictorial language and attempt to understand what this means and what this uh, articulates. And uh, translating this sequence was by no easy, no easy matter. And so mm -hmm. we had to constantly triangulate the, uh, the German text of Ha's explanations by actually going back to follow the runes themselves and look at how to render this uh, into English by literally teaching ourselves to try to read the runes, which caused quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of head scratching. Yes, and Ha was the father of Philemon. And yeah, that's what he claims at this point. At this point. So why did he send young runes? Well, he claims that this is his science, this is his, his, his language. Um, then uh, later on, um, the figure of Fanes appears, and who then, in a way, says that the the runes really came from him. Mm -hmm. That's what um, I was indicating earlier in terms of this a lot of complex layering yeah. uh, taking place, where Jung reaches an understanding, he has a fantasy, then the fantasy changes and deepens, which then leads to a new understanding and. Mm -hmm. This whole thing moves on um, in concert. Jung's self experimentation here, you say, marked a withdrawal from science. And as it progressed, there was an increasing return to science, but a transformed science. That's right. And that. You mentioned in the protocols that he came back to the human side from science and that the cost was considerable. He said, I paid with my life and I paid with my science. If you look at the text of Lee Ben Ovis in the Black Books, you find in um, a germinating form or a nucleus many of the conceptions that then later come to fruition in Jung's major late works, such as Ion, Mysterium Conjunctionis, and Answer to Job, just to name um, three of them. So if you just think about that in terms of time period, these are conceptions, ideas, formulations that Jung has in the teens and early 20s. And it's then taking him a good um, three, four decades to find a way to present them to the world mm -hmm. in a fitting form. Mm -hmm. And that's going through elaborate additional study, quite literally decades of study in comparative symbolism, ranging from Eastern thought to the Western alchemical tradition, through the history of uh, Christian dogmas and symbolism. So just seen in that sense, you get a sense of the scale of his undertaking. He could have in a way, just put out the conceptions as they were. But instead, no, it, it, he was wanting to sort of see to what extent w were these conceptions, if they were indeed uh, aspects of a universal spirit of the depths, 
of the depths of the human mind, what he later called the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. Then he wanted to be able to find parallels and study study them in conjunction. Or well, what were the, the the common elements? What was um, how was this all put together? Um, so he wants to understand as a psychologist the vision making process. He's then interested in the genesis of these visions, not just in presenting them as is. And say so that that task takes decades. Mm -hmm. That's the cost. Yeah. In the webinar that you gave on October 18th, I, I liked how you said this. You said for everyone who was wondering what happened after Philemon and Christ met in the garden, the answers are in volumes six and seven, and you say they are truly worth the wait. I, you know, I've been a little conflicted about in promoting the release of the Black Books and in doing this episode with you, I've been posting uh, just a few quotes from the books on on social media and not just being careful not to give away too much. So is there anything here you would like to give away a little bit of that? Um, there's, uh, there's plenty in a way. I, <laughs> I, 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 I honestly wouldn't know mm -hmm. uh, where, where to begin except to say also that when you follow this um, in, in terms of some of the conceptions in it such as the ones we discussed are are not simple they're complicated yes um, but you you then have the benefit of following this through first-hand narration mm -hmm. and in rich figural language which is in that sense more accessible than the abstract formulations in Jung's later works. You say, oh, that's actually what he was trying to indicate. That's right. what he's on about. There's a level where um, if you're attuned to the imagination, there's an imagistic accessibility in the work. And also you have the first person perspective. You have the pathos of um, the struggle he was uh, engaged in, which is how how he became who he is. And so regardless of whether it, it, you're interested in you or not, it's, an, it's a, a situation where you can say, okay, this is how one man at the, um, the time of the First World War uh, engaged in an activity to refine meaning in his life and a way from that to enable other individuals to find meaning in theirs. And also it then provides one with a window into the psychology of creativity in terms of you can follow the elaboration of a psychology from dream, from fantasy through then later um, conceptualization and uh, elaboration. And that's uh, it's quite unusual that you have all of those steps. So there's um, much in it that is not just of interest by itself, except regardless of whether you have any interest directly in Jung or accept his conceptions or not, but that can show uh, a window into um, the creative imagination mm -hmm. and its regenerative powers. Yes, and, and another theme uh, that you said was uh, important to Jung at that time was that he was concerned with finding the right relation to the higher powers, to the gods, and where man was in all of this, how to relate to them, how to learn from them, but all along maintaining one's own human stand, standpoint that it was critical that one did not give oneself over to the gods, but that one maintained one's human perspective. I thought that was very important. That's right, not to be their blind spokesman. And in a way, 
that's precisely where he finds the value of psychology and you could say remains a psychologist in terms of devote his activities to, to that. It then also gives the wider uh, cosmological or soteriological setting for Jung's understanding of the significance of psychology, i.e. in his view developments in human awareness are not just a value per se, but are a part of, in a way, the creation becoming more aware of itself and contribute incrementally in however small a manner toward that. I view that the human is a mirror in which um, the creation can become more uh, more visible to itself. Mm-hmm. So in conclusion, I'd like to read what you included in volume one, uh, you said that at the beginning of Liber Secundus in Liber Novus, Jung wrote, the door of the mysterium has closed behind me. And you continue, long have I wished to echo this sentiment, which the bringing to fruition of this edition makes possible. So I'd like to thank you, Professor Shandasani, for sharing your insights with us here today and for bringing the Black Books to life. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, enjoy the Mysterium. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G, dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, and now on Amazon Music. And it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel, Jungi and Laura. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts or tune in. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. Thank you to our supporters, Peter Stewart Lackanen, Victoria Hall, Liz Jefferson, Oksana Holtman, Aladdin Fazel, Anne Jung, Patrick Reeves, Storm Chestavani, Niche, Steve Drinkard, Don M., John Smith, Siraj Sirajudin, Brian C. Short, Tom Lassels, and to all of our anonymous donors and friends. And with very special thanks to Anne Casement and to Christopher Rodriguez and the entire Philemon Foundation. This is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Young. <laughs> <laughs>